Now, I just mentioned my uncle Gregory of Prisha. His family arrived in 1927. You may recall that this picture dates back to 1906. Gregory, in Russian Grigory, in Yiddish Hirsch, is this person, the oldest of all the children, who, however, was not the first to leave Russia or the Soviet Union. This is my father, and this is, of course, Polya, who left in 1923 with me, my mother, with the help of the rich uncle, Lou Zygmunt, Uncle Lyova, as we call him in Russia. And then, also with the help of Uncle Lyova, four years later, uh, Grisha and his family arrived which was, of course, a very major event in the family. Suddenly, there were two families forming the larger family of three. But what was more important, that suddenly I had a playmate, because he is at exactly my age. There's an age difference of only three months. And I would like to now turn to this event to discuss another strand in the history of the family and the place. When Uncle Grisha arrived in her bin, when he came with the family, his wife, Clara, and his son, Misha, Moses, as I say in Russian, and as a matter of fact, uh, at the same moment also with another son on the way, known uh, as uh, Lucia, in English now Elias, Elias Grossman. Now what we see before us is uh, Clara Grossman, and Misha. This picture must have been taken very soon after they arrived. Now let us look at the photo that apparently was taken at the very same time of Misha and myself. Here we're a little jollier, especially Misha. Now, so far as education was concerned, the age of six, Misha first went to a well-known Russian school where the instruction was in Russian, which in fact was only down the block from the apartment house where they were living. In fact, the same apartment house where we were living in. Uh, it's, it was a so-called commercial school. It was, of course, open to everyone, but it tended to attract a large proportion of the Jewish kids. I would say almost all the Jewish kids and of course Russian kids too, but the Russian kids went to other schools as well. So one reason that uh, the students were disproportionately uh, Jewish is the, is the location, because Jews tend to live more in the commercial part of town, while Russians tended to live more in the so-called new town, which was more centered on uh, the administration of the railroad. And there were not all that many Jews employed by the railroad for various reasons. But, as far as I am concerned, uh, I did not go to school uh, right away, but had uh, some private teachers until uh, 1930, uh, when uh, I was enrolled in a German school. The school I was first sent to in, in 1930 was the local German school. This is the building. Hindenburg Schule. Hindenburg at that time was the president of Germany. The school was government-owned, that is, owned by the German government. But at that time, in 1930, was the so-called Weimar government, the democratic German government, not yet the Nazi government. It was a small school, as you can see. And in fact, if we turn to the next picture, that shows the whole school there were all together oh, about four or five grades in that school. Are, that are you in this picture? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know to, where you are? I, know where <laughs> I, I always know where I am. <laughs> okay. Okay. So to answer the question further, I hadn't yet mentioned that Misha joined me in that school for the last two years I was there, but both Misha and I are right here. Both of us were strangely. Russian schoolboys uniforms. You notice that our clothes are different from the other kids and the Russian uniform had a kind of uh, semi-military looking tunic that buttoned up at the neck and so on. It didn't, as far as I know, in any way hamper us in the German school. 
Now, why did my parents send me, and then later on Misha's parents sent Misha to the German school? Well, to begin with, in the Russian cultural tradition, especially among the more educated people, the knowledge of foreign languages was always considered an important mark of an educated person, and especially of the major languages. There was also a tradition of teaching these languages to one's kids beginning at a rather early point. I think I had some previous private training in German. I don't now remember my German private teacher, but I must have had because I am sure I did not join the German school as it were cold. I knew a little bit of German. I attended the German school from uh, the fall of 1930 until the end of the 1932-33 academic year. So when I started it, I had just turned nine. Interestingly enough, at about the same time, my mother was taking private lessons in English and my father sort of picked up English in the business environment because he was engaged not only in the local manufacturing business, but also in business that imported certain things, exported certain things. There were a few teachers, German, of course, uh, the ones are shown, there are four shown here. The one here in the middle was a teacher and also the principal of the school. Her this one here was Herr Hildebrand, who, uh, among other things, taught us English. I remember the very first words of English I ever learned were learned in a German school, in a Russian setting, in China, at that time, almost uh, already occupied by the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> and they taught a fairly stiff curriculum. We got. Uh, a lot of math and the geography and German literature and so on and so forth. And I became, in those few years, given the age of course, I became fairly fluent in German. At that time, in addition to Misha, some of my closest friends were a few German kids from the school. German uh, remained with me for the rest of my life and I'm still able to understand German quite well, though I speak with some hesitation. But of course, this was not due entirely to my three years in the German school. It was also due to the fact that uh, at a certain point I found myself in the army in Germany and in the army of occupation in Germany and then graduate school and uh, pursued my professional careers. As I mentioned, uh, I stayed through three classes and the last semester of that class was the spring semester of 1930. As we know, Hitler came to power in January 1933. He was uh, appointed by the president at St. Hindenburg, where his name graced the building of the school. He brought Hitler in as the chancellor, gave him a free hand, and uh, the Nazi regime began in Germany with uh, everything else had been only too well. It's not surprising that what Hitler was up to was very well known in her business, particularly among the Jewish colony in Berlin, Jewish journals and so on, a lot about anti-Semitism and the, the danger to Jews that Hitler brought. So my parents informed her Krutenat at a certain point that under circumstances, though they were thoroughly satisfied with the school and nothing against the school, uh, they feel that they cannot keep me, the same as said by Misha, in the school any longer. Now. Uh, I still remember the, the conversation with uh, Krutinat. He spoke Russian to him. He spoke somewhat broken Russian, somewhat funny Russian, but they understood uh, each other. I still remember how he was pleading with them not to take me and my cousin out. And he was saying, I guess what you expect him to say, that the Nazi phenomenon was a passing phenomenon and Hitler would not last very long, and that we should not break up our German language education, and we should continue, but they saw much clearer as it <laughs> turned out and took us out, our parents did. I think it would be uh, quite appropriate for me to mention the rest of that story, however. The rest of that story uh, is the second act, and the second act took place in 1978, in other words, some 45 years later. 
1978, John and I were attending a World Slavic Congress in Zagreb, Croatia, at that time, Yugoslavia. And uh, one of um, uh, John's colleagues stepped up to me and said that um, he met someone at, the, at this Congress that he thought I might want to meet because this person is originally from Harbin. So he introduced me to a young lady, uh, younger than I, significantly younger, younger than I, uh, but already an adult, who was, uh, had a faculty position in a provincial German uh, university, the University of Oldenburg, which is not a very well-known German university, where she taught Russian literature. So we started talking. Well, it turned uh, the story as it was finally put together piece by piece was that she is the daughter of one of the girls here who was my classmate. She was born when my classmate was still very young. Her father, however, is not in this picture. Her father was precisely that person that my parents might appear on the scene, namely he was sent by the Nazis to run the school as a Nazi school, a young man. A Nazi, or no, he fell in love with the girl. Now then she was still, I guess, about high school age or junior high school age. Well, eventually, I think at a very early age, I guess she may have been about 17 or so, he married her. That fellow who came out to run the school as a Nazi school. And uh, he, uh, uh, and they had uh, two children, of whom uh, the young woman that I met in Zagreb was one. She also told me that when the Soviet army uh, moved into uh, Harbin in 1945, of course, uh, her, father, uh, her father was still there and he was arrested. Uh, and her grandfather on the mother's side, the father of the girl in here was also arrested because at one time he illegally left the Soviet Union with his family, so he was arrested for that. Mm -hmm. He was a German, but of the Russian Germans who had been living in Russia for generations, but still feeling a German speech, mm -hmm. and so on. And, um, and so it goes, uh, sort of the closing <laughs> of the circle. Was there any was there any news of the former principal who had? Uh, I asked her. She didn't know anyone. Yeah. Of course, you know she was born quite a few years after he, mm -hmm. that principal presumably was called back. Whatever happened to him, no idea. Yeah. But he himself was a very decent person. Well, yeah. She had gone to Harbin with her mother, perhaps, yeah. uh, before we ever got there. She was one of the first people I think that we met, and she sent Greg a whole pack of photographs. Yeah. He went three yeah. years later, and uh, there was a sort of almost guilt feeling on her part about it all. Which part in Hers, the Nazi side? Was because she was the daughter of the Nazi, and uh, somehow you could sense that she. Mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. You're right, and uh, I sent copies of these pictures. Uh, this is these are not the only pictures from the German school I have. I sent copies of these pictures to her mother. Mm -hmm. in the event that her mother did not, uh, might not have them, because mm -hmm. I had nothing against her mother. Because yeah. she married a Nazi, even she was still my classmate at the age of 10 or 11. Yeah, well, um, it's hard to blame anybody at the age of 17 who they marry. Yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, uh, but it was also interesting that how she uh, queried me about life in her being in those days. And uh, she was uh, very, very interested in, in what I had to say about it. That we had a long conversation on that occasion, two, three hours. When we left the uh, German school, our parents uh, uh, enrolled us in a newly established school, which called itself the Harbin English Secondary School. It uh, uh, offered instruction in English. There was one uh, lone and rather pathetic looking English woman who uh, sort of provided the excuse for it, but all the Russians, all the others, uh, the administrators and the teachers, 
where a Russian who spoke English or thought they spoke English or pretended to speak English nonetheless. <laughs> and we used the English language textbooks, of course, so the conversation between uh, students was uh, in Russian and uh, even conversation with teachers often was in Russian. It was a small school, rather poor school. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, the I think uh, Misha's in my class at probably about, uh, again, 10, 12 students at most, and there were probably, uh, what, about uh, three, four classes is what's uh, a kind of combination, junior high and, uh, and high school, from which uh, both Misha and I graduated at the age of uh, 17. In, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to say age of 15, sorry, age of 15 in 1936. Uh, or to be more exact, we, we left that school at the age of 15. I think there were still more advanced classes uh, because obviously they planned for a uh, longer curriculum, even they called themselves a secondary school, than, uh, than uh, what was implied by our le leaving at the age of 15. Uh, the um, uh, school uh, also tried to maintain fairly high academic standards uh, and it was uh, not very much like an English school, for example, there were no sports uh, facilities or sports arrangements at all. But indeed, you know, the kind of sport arrangements that American schools have uh, are not necessarily typical of all countries and uh, a lot of the uh, sports that young people of that age and their teens and in, in very many countries of Europe, uh, and uh, also in our case, uh, engaged in, were usually engaged in through separate sport organizations <laughs> for youth. And these also were frequently oriented towards a certain political ideology or a, a certain uh, uh, perhaps religious uh, confession or whatever. Well, anyway, so it was, and it had uh, hardly any uh, lab equipment and was lucky to always have a supply of chalk and, and the blackboards were not particularly impressive either. Uh, but, uh, but they did insist, they did insist on a lot of homework and studying and we studied a good deal of math and, that's, and that. So that when Misha and I then transferred, as I shall be describing very soon, when Misha and I transferred to, uh, um, um, uh, the uh, British school, we found uh, that British school to be rather easy compared to what we had gone through first in the German school and then in the so-called English school in Herbin, the Herbin English Secondary School. Now this little uh, photo shows uh, uh, Misha and uh, myself and Lucy. Lucy was not uh, enrolled at school, he was much too young, but uh, for some reason his parents made him a uniform that corresponded to our school uniform <laughs> so that he would feel better or something or other. This then was the school uniform and there was a kind of uh, patch here which uh, was the uh, insignia of the school um, and that was probably uh, one of the more imposing things about that school. But it taught and we learned. It was not affiliated with anything English or British or American or anything. As I say, there was an English woman there who uh, uh, added some very similitude to the name of the school. <laughs> and she taught some you know, English and so on. We also had some instruction in Russian. For example, we had this, uh, would become in any Russian school, courses on Russian literature, history of Russian literature and so on. And those were obviously taught in Russian. Mm -hmm. It was clear that the teachers were generally uh, in bad economic straits, bad material straits, and it was a private school, so our parents had to pay, and uh, uh, the market for that sort of thing was limited. Mm -hmm. In any case, um, yeah, what it did is obviously to some extent uh, not only maintain but improve our English, but it did that also teaches high school or junior high school subjects. So we were there from uh, 1933 to 1936, from the age of 12 to the age of uh, 15, both of us. 
So, in uh, 1936, as I said, at the age of 15, we left that school and we were then uh, enrolled by our parents in uh, a real British school in Tianjin, China. But I'd like to say a few more things. Uh, after all, we've reached the age of 15, starting in 1927, at the age of uh, six. That's a very important span of one's life. Um, I cannot fully speak for Misha, but I think you would agree with me, but uh, I certainly uh, left a relatively sheltered life during that period, uh, a relatively withdrawn life, not from choice, but because of the circumstances. The circumstances, first of all, were, were that we attended small schools and not the large schools where most of the Children of my parents' friends attended, most of the children we met elsewhere attended, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, the, probably the main uh, venues, as it were, for meeting others of our age, um, not counting summer resorts, where, to which we usually went, and more on that a little later too, uh, was the uh, skating rink. Now, Herbin, as you know, um, has pretty much a Siberian climate, uh, so that uh, there are lots of opportunities for skating. Also, fortunately, it doesn't have too much snowfall, so one uh, didn't have to wait for the snow to be cleared too often. And uh, skating is very much in the Russian tradition, at least in this century. Uh, so um, that was a main uh, form of recreation sport. I would say for those who were not seriously involved in sports. Uh, and on the skating rink, one met lots of kids. Uh, yeah. And I remember, you know, several times a week spending a couple of hours in the afternoon before it got too dark and got usually dark rather early after school on the skating rink. Uh, were there fun. organized games? Uh, uh, no, actually we, actually we hardly played hockey. It was uh, just uh, skating, right. uh, skating around and sort of a little bit of pretending to figure skate and uh, mm -hmm. holding hands or things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course there was always the uh, warm social situation in the warm uh, uh, hut there where we uh, uh, changed our skates for shoes and vice versa. Uh, it was well heated usually, you talked to a lot of people and so on. So that was a kind of uh, uh, important social venue, especially for people such as ourselves and who uh, went to small schools. That must have gone on uh, for about seven months, eight months a year. Eight is a little too much, yeah. but uh, it after, went on. after school and on weekends, so that it might be four or five times a week. You, you, you have to remember that uh, the ice was natural, not artificial. Yeah, oh, that's cool. yeah. yeah, I would say probably more like six. Okay. Uh, by mm -hmm. late October, uh, the ice already would be frozen. It, we, we didn't skate on any natural body of water. It was an artificially flooded area. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, only two doors from where Misha, Misha lived and where See. I hmm. used to live, okay. so and only really two blocks where I, from where I lived later. So it was really an important part of your childhood. It was an important part of your childhood, mm -hmm. yeah. also, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uh, the ice would uh, get too soft, I would say, sometime in April. Mm -hmm. The other reason why uh, uh, we left a relatively sheltered life uh, was that uh, we did not belong to any student organization, I mean youth organizations at that time. Most uh, Jewish uh, boys and many girls of our age, some of whom are now old men and uh, older women in Berkeley as a matter of fact, <laughs> And I'm thinking in particular of Boris Bressler, whom uh, you may know, um, uh, very much belonged to Jewish organizations. These organizations were uh, almost without exception uh, Zionist, and indeed the youth organization called Petar, Petar, which uh, was an acronym and uh, which uh, was affiliated with the more militant Zionist organization in the world, it was called the Revisionist Zionist, led by Zabatinsky. Um, they um, 
they uh, engage in kind of, uh, I would say, essentially play, but play of a semi-military nature of wearing uniforms and marching with the uh, Zionist flag and so on. But uh, they did also lots of other things. They had clubhouse and played, uh, played ping pong and uh, uh, also, you know, when the weather permitted, uh, had all kinds of sports activities and uh, uh, sports teams and whatnot, which played not only other Jewish teams, uh, but uh, played other teams as well. Um, and some very fine sportsmen actually came out of uh, these groups. But we, Misha and I, never belonged to these. Um, I must say that um, to some extent uh, I was myself turned off from them because of this uh, you know, f uh, play at uh, military uh, behavior, the uniforms, etc., and, uh, and the kind of hierarchical organization. Uh, but uh, it also must be um, noted that uh, a very high proportion of these young people even before the Second World War started, they emigrated to Israel, but then Palestine, mm -hmm. as Chalutzim, you know who the Chalutzim, the pioneers, lived in tents and uh, built up a country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was, uh, and, uh, these people, of course, uh, who went there were uh, looked up. Later on, uh, with the Second World War coming, when it was possible, uh, there was much greater migration and when the Second World War ended, uh, when it became really possible, you had greater migration. And the interesting thing is that these young people from her bend created in Israel after the war, together with some older people and some other people from China, a very strong organization called uh, the Organization of uh, Immigrants from China. Mm -hmm. or its Hebrew equivalent, which to this very day publishes a monthly journal, which I receive. Unfortunately, most of it is devoted to obituaries nowadays. <laughs> but it also prints a lot of interesting things about those early days, and mm -hmm. the, the people of those early days. Mm -hmm. And the, um, uh, the Chinese element, the, Ch the Chinese Jews, as they were called, uh, uh, in fact, played um, a at least a proportional and probably much more than a proportional role in the creation of Israel. Mm -hmm.